Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the skies turn forever from the sky. Hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand. Keep me safe till the storm passes by. Many times Satan whispers, There is no need to try, For there's no end of sorrow, There's no hope by and by, But the day Thou art with me, and tomorrow I'll rise where the sun never darkens the sky. Till the storm passes over, till the thunder sounds no more, till the sky, sky rolls forever. From the sky Hold me fast Let me stand In the hollow Of thy hand Keep me safe Till the storm Passes by Keep me safe Till the storm Passes by book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to talk about uh, Christian living. You know, you, you uh, sometimes go by the drugstore and you'll see these magazines up in the rack and they'll say country living. Some will say city life living. Uh, they have different names. Okay, sorry. What just meant my mic's not on. You'll have country living and you'll have city living. You'll have all kinds of different uh, places where people live. Well, I want to talk about Christian living, how important it is uh, to live the kind of life that is pleasing to Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and verse 17, <clears throat> these words. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And the word reconciliation simply means to bring together, to break down the wall of partition between us and to give us harmony and peace together with our Heavenly Father. Let's bow before him at this time and pray. God our Father, we thank you today for your precious word. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts. We pray that the Holy Spirit will be in our midst, that he will bless the word and give it life. I pray you would strengthen me and speak through me, Lord. Though I'm a weak vessel, just a man saved by the grace of God, I pray that I can be a blessing to your people. I pray, our Father, that if there be one in our number that has a spiritual need in their life, maybe a physical need in their life, that somehow your word might give them the answer they need for life. Thank you, O Lord, for your salvation. Thank you for redeeming a sinner like me and showing me mercy. Bless your people, Father. Be with Roger Miller. 
We pray, O oh Father, that uh, the doctors may be able to help him, but by your mighty power we know that you're able. And I pray that he knows Christ, that if he doesn't, you might uh, use the Wilsons to witness to him and share the gospel of life. We thank you for Mr. Hill being with us today. We pray you'd bless his life, touch his body. We pray you'd bring healing to him, Lord. And we pray that you'd strengthen him and bless him and encourage him. Be with all the other people here. Bless their lives and have your will in your way. In Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. Amen. The Christian living or the Christian life has been described in many different ways by many different people and I would like for us to consider uh, in the book of Ephesians uh, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 beginning at verse 8 and it says for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on, it says in verse 10, For we, that is the saved, are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Now in the world in which we live today, uh, people can do some amazing things. Uh, there are several videos I've watched where uh, this man is uh, moving uh, jars in a box and they're slid to him and he throws them up in the air about 10 or 12 feet and they land perfectly. And he keeps the whole process moving by grabbing and throwing, grabbing and throwing. And every throw has to be perfect. And he does it without any hesitation. You've seen, I'm sure, some of these things on TV where they do concrete work and they do work that usually takes forever and they do it in a matter of seconds because they're really good at what they do. You know, some people have a, have a trade and they know how to do it. It's kind of like cutting hair. Uh, my dad was a barber. My daughter is a beautician. And, uh, but every time I get my hair cut, I watch in the mirror as those people take their fingers and it's almost like they're playing a piano or something and they're cutting your hair, and they're layering it, and they're doing all this stuff. And I just sit there amazed at how quickly this one lady cut my hair in about three minutes. And I mean, she gave me a good haircut, but in three minutes she was done, whereas most people take 20 minutes. But she's really good at what she does. And so the Bible says that we are the workmanship of God. We are His workmanship. That is, that He molded us and made us, and man is so wonderfully and intricately made. You know, they're trying to make uh, these uh, different uh, artificial intelligence uh, devices that look like a person, and they're supposedly able to do a lot of things and over in Japan and other parts of the world, people are buying these uh, artificial intelligence people to clean their house, to walk their dog, to do their cooking. Uh, it, it's amazing. And some of them will actually talk to you. But with all of the work they've done, I heard them discussing it. This man said, we're only now touching the very hem of the garment. He said, we've done so much, but in reality, to produce a human being, it's nowhere near what a human being is. 
Just look at all of the intricacy, the five senses of a human. Your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, your digestive system, your heart, your blood, the bones in your body. Everything about you is uniquely made and created by God. The Bible says we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I saw a thing where a, a young man was uh, crossing the highway and he looked over and he saw an elderly lady and she was about to get hit by a bus. And I mean, he had to cover a good 100, 100 feet and he got to her like that and he grabbed her up in his arms and moved her out of the way just as this big bus came roaring through. I saw another example where a man had fallen on a railroad track and the, the train was coming extremely fast and this guy jumped down in and grabbed that man and got him out and no sooner had they cleared the rails than that train just shoo, went through there so fast it would just cause your head to spin. People are gifted and many times people are able to use their athletic ability and their quickness to do things that we just normally, we, we think that couldn't be done. That's impossible. But with God, we know that not only are all things possible, but all things are probable with God. And so he says we're created unto good works. Now what does good works mean? Good works means things that benefit humanity and things that honor God. You have to have these two things to really do good works. Number one, it has to honor God. And number two, it has to benefit uh, humanity in some way. Help someone out. Maybe a child. Maybe an elderly person. Maybe who knows who it might be. But we do good works to glorify God and to help our fellow man. You know, you would have to, to, to be a, a very uncaring person not to be concerned with your fellow man. They were telling a story. I was listening to a news broadcast uh, about this uh, little child who had been lost on the streets of New York. And the little baby had been going from person to person saying, I've lost my mom. Will you help me? People were just pushing the baby away. Somebody was filming it. You know, They were there to make sure the baby was okay, but they wanted to see how hard-hearted people were. And that child was out on the, on the street for like six hours until finally one woman said to the little child, where is your parents? And she got the little child by the arm and took the little child to the police station to get help for her. But for six hours, the little baby wondered, or the little child wondered aimlessly, and not a single person would even try to help. It is true, you know, out in the country, I was born over in Owsley County in the country, and whenever you drive down the road with your car, you do this. Everybody you see, you do this, or you, you wait. You know, when I, moved, when I moved to a bigger city, I'd drive down the road and I'd put my hand up. People would give me the awfulest look, you know, like, what are you doing? And, and when I was raised as a boy, Whenever you walk by somebody, you always say, Hello, ma'am, or hello, sir. Well, today you speak to somebody you don't know, and you're liable to get punched in the nose. Because we don't have that kind of compassion and care in the smaller towns like uh, the kindness I described. It's much different in these bigger towns. But we are His workmanship and we are created 
unto good works which God hath before ordained. That means that God has purposed these things that we do even before we ever even knew we were going to do it. I believe that God sovereignly puts people together for His own glory and His own honor. When I was single, I prayed to the Lord to give me a wife. And I said, Lord, I want to have a godly wife. I want to have a wife that loves God and loves the Bible and will go to church with me and we can serve God together. And I would meet other young ladies and I would talk to them about their Christian life and, and uh, I'd I just would come to the conclusion, you, you're not living what you say you, you, you believe. And when the Lord brought me to Kathy, I took one look at her, and I, I heard her talk, and I knew in my heart she was the one. And I even told her. She came over to me to tell me about another girl, and I said, I don't like her. She said, well, who do you like? I said, I like you. And... Uh, I knew in my heart. I, I, don't, I can't describe it. I can't tell you how, but God placed that on my heart that I knew she was going to be the one for me. And we've been married all of these years. We love each other. Our love is stronger than ever before. And that did not happen by accident. That was God putting us together, just like he did you and your mate. You know how he worked to put you all together, how he, he brought things to pass. I mean, it's amazing. I, I could tell you different things, and I'm sure you could tell me different things about how God worked to bring you together and give you your life together. And so we see this is all ordained be, by God for we are his workmanship, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by the which is called the circumcision. Remember the Jewish boy, when he reached his eighth day, he was circumcised. And... Uh, circumcision became a picture of what God does to the heart. God circumcised the heart when you get saved. He gives you a new heart. He makes your heart clean. And so it is that we are new creatures. If any man or woman or child be in Christ, notice it's in the emphatic. He is a new creature. It's emphatic. It's not something that might happen. It's not something that could happen. It does happen. If you are in Christ, you are a new creature, a new creation. All things pass away, and behold, all things are become new that's exactly what it means to be born again remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he wanted to know how to be saved and he began to ask the Lord questions about the spirit and the Lord explained to him he said you see the trees and you see how the leaves and the branches move but you don't see the air it moves by God's supernatural power and it's invisible, but look what it can do. So it is with the Spirit, he said. When the Spirit of God moves upon you, when the Spirit of God brings conviction of your sins and points you to Christ and you look and live, you're a new creature. So he says... Remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh 
who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time we were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. Covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. Now that perfectly describes who I was. I had no hope in this world. I was lost and undone. I did not know the Lord. I had never known anybody that truly demonstrated that they knew the Lord. I knew a lot of hypocrites. I knew a lot of people that would say they were Christians on Sunday morning and then they'd go out during the week and cuss like a sailor and live wicked lives. But that was not something that I felt was real. I thought if I really met someone who knew Christ, they would truly be different people. I worked with a gentleman when I was first in Lexington in the concrete business. I worked with, for a man named Fisk. And he, he was uh, co-owners of a big concrete business. And uh, one day I was out and I was a laborer. And he drove by and he pulled up and he said, Young man, do you smoke? And I said, No. Do you drink? I said, No. He said, Do you cuss? I said, No. He said, I'd like to have you work with me. He said, Put your stuff down and come on and get in the truck with me. I said, Okay. So I went and got in the truck with him and I started riding around town and wherever he'd have a little something needed to be done, he'd take me and he'd say, here, Tony, go and finish that job. And I worked with him for probably six months. I never heard the man one time cuss. Never heard the man uh, use the name of the Lord in vain. I never heard him lose his temper. He was just as even killed as he could be and later on I found out he was a Christian. And he said, I want a man that I can take around my family, that I can take with me to a business, and he won't be doing things that will hurt my business. And so he promoted me. He wanted, he wanted me to become a foreman and be an independent contractor and just drive around doing jobs he wanted me to do. But the Lord was calling me into the ministry. And I quit that job in order to go to Bible college. And so I found someone that, that lived for God. I met my wife's mom and dad. They were some of the, the greatest blessings I ever had in my life. To get to be around people who really lived the Christian life and walk with God. Because, you know, folks, a lot of folks will claim to, to really live the Christian life, but in reality, they don't. They go behind the barn, and they do this, and they do that, and they slip around and do wicked things, and they think that because nobody knows it, that they can get away with it. But you can't. God knows. Well, when we think about all of this, we realize that we are His creation. I think one of the first things that we see in the Christian life is gratitude. And I'd like you to take your Bible quickly for a moment and turn to Romans uh, chapter 12. Uh, Romans chapter 12, and uh, I'd like to read verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible says these words in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, it's a, this, this Greek word here for present was often used uh, when, when a man would 
join the military or he would join the armed forces. Back in the Old Testament, they would only pick the most prized uh, people to be in the military. And this word present means that on the, the day that you were called, you would come and you would present yourself and they would, they would look at your whole body to make sure that you had no faults. So the Lord says that we're to present ourselves, our bodies, a living sacrifice. The Lord don't want us to die. He wants us to live. You know, when I was first saved, I, I really was homesick for heaven. And a lot of the songs I, I wrote were about dying. I wanted to go home. I really did. I didn't feel at home in this world. All of my friends turned on me after I got saved because they didn't like what I believed and the life I was living, and I felt very lonely. But the Lord wants us to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Notice this is an act of gratitude. Gratitude for what? For God saving you. You know, everybody should be this way. If you are truly interested in doing the will of God, you ought to be involved in the work of God. Amen. Things that we are interested in, we get involved in, don't we? So this is an act of gratitude. And be not conformed to this world. There's a difficult one. The world will constantly tug at you and pull at you and they want you to do what they do. They want you to act like they act. They want you to go out and get drunk and party and live an ungodly life and then they'll accept you. After I got saved, I was working on a summer job with Fayette County School Systems. And uh, there was a young lady working with me. And she tried to get me to go with her uh, to a party on a Saturday night. And I told her I wouldn't go. And a couple weeks later, she said, I'm going to get, I'm going to find out what makes you tick. And she was trying to get me to go here and do this and do that. And I said, listen, I go to church on Sunday morning. I go to church on Sunday evening. I go to church on Wednesday night. I read my Bible. I pray. I, I visit people. I do the work of the Lord. That's my life. And she said, I, I don't believe that. I can't understand that. She said, what fun are you having? I said, I'm having more fun than you would imagine. And I'm living a life that is pleasing to God. Now the world don't understand this. So he says, do not be conformed to the ways of this world. In verse 2, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Just like a butterfly, before it was a butterfly, it was a caterpillar. And a certain day came and it wrapped itself up in a cocoon. And there it hung until the day when the cocoon would crack open and the butterfly would spread its beautiful wings. That's the same process almost that God did to us. We were lost and undone. We were dead in trespasses and sins. The Spirit of God used the gospel to bring us to repentance and faith and outfolded these beautiful spiritual type wings which are the Christian life and the graces that God gives us in Christ. It's amazing. I, I heard a woman uh, in a courtroom and her own daughter had been raped and murdered by a man 
And they allowed everybody to speak before they sentenced him. And the woman stood there, the mother, tears flowing down her face. And she spoke to the young man. And she said, young man, I've forgiven you for what you've done. You're going to have to answer to God for what you've done, but I've forgiven you. And that courtroom went just as silent. I mean, it was like you would hear a pin drop. And then all of a sudden, you heard somebody sobbing. And it was the man who murdered her daughter. And when she told him, I forgive you, he just burst into tears. And he was crying out and, and just, he was, he was un, 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 you couldn't console him. He was just so moved by her compassion. Now, could you do that? Could I do that? I don't know. You think about somebody murdering your own child and then torturing them before they killed them. But look at what our, our father did. They took his son, a man who never did any evil, a man in whom there was no guile, and they spit upon him and they beat him with a cat of nine tails, and they put a crown of thorns on his head, and they spit in his face, and they did everything imaginable, and then hung him on a cross. But yet the Father says, I forgive you. We have the power through Christ. So not only is there gratitude, but there is faithfulness. We see uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, let's turn there for just a moment, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. The Bible says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest be to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. That's what the church is. Not the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church did not start until 350 A.D. with Constantine. Constantine united uh, a religious group of people with the state, called it the church, and forced people to join it or they would be put to death. But for 350 years or 300 years before that, the Lord's churches had been in existence. We know from Erdman's uh, church history that there is evidence of at least 200 churches by the end of the second century. And those were true churches of the Lord Jesus. They weren't called Catholic. Many of them were called Anabaptists. They were called Waldensians, Pretributians, Henricans. Uh, but they were in no way uh, uh, connected to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has been a murderer of God's people. You trace the history of Roman Catholicism and you will find a history of death and persecution throughout her years of life. We're not Catholic. We're Baptist. Amen. We believe that the Lord's kind of church belongs to Him and is contending for the faith. But here's my point. If you're truly a new creature in Christ, you are faithful. You've read Hebrews 10, 25. I'm sure where the Bible tells us not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. But so much more uh, as you see the day approaching, encouraging each other and, and lifting each other up, 
going to church, being faithful in the house of God is not something you can take or leave. It's something that is essential for Christian growth. A good church that teaches the Bible, that preaches the gospel, that teaches all the word of God without apology. And there are not many of them. We're not a Southern Baptist church. We don't, uh, we don't pay some hierarchy in uh, Louisville or somewhere else to run us. We're an independent Baptist church, which means each member votes as God leads you and directs you. We're an autonomous church. We're not part of a convention. The convention is corrupt. They're teaching critical race theory. They're ordaining women in the ministry, and it won't be long until they'll be ordaining homosexuals. It's already on the way. And all these other denominations are already doing it. Look at the Methodists. Look at the Presbyterians. All these different groups. They've departed from the Word of God. Very few are remaining true to the Scripture. We ought to also not only be faithful, but we ought to give as we can. Malachi teaches us to bring all of our offerings into the Father's house that there might be meat. We see that services uh, in the Lord's churches uh, are there so that we can continue the Lord's work to be a blessing to those that are in need. I've been told by different people who have tried to call churches here in Lexington that I was the only pastor they could actually call and reach. Well, Mr. Hill rang my phone number. It didn't go to some secretary or some recording. You know who answered it? Your pastor. My phone is right beside me all the time. And I want it there for a reason. I had one pastor tell me, why in the world would you want people to know your phone number? Well, they'll call you. And I said, that's what I want them to do. I want them to call me. I want to talk to them about the Lord and point them to Christ. But so many of these men want to run off and hide. They don't want to do God's work. Now, I'm not saying all of them are like that, but many of them are. Go home and, and pick you out ten churches and try to call and get a hold of their pastor and see which one you get a hold of. I'm telling you, 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 you'll be amazed at how many will not answer their phone or it'll go to a recording and you'll never hear from them if you don't have pull or contact. Now, that's a shame. A pastor is a man of the people. And he should be, re, he should be, the people should be able to reach him. They should be able to call him and talk to him because he's there for the people. Now, we also see that we owe a great debt. The Bible says in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, verses 19 through 20, Go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize those that believe, and then teach them to observe all things. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Go, teach, baptize, and teach. Teach His Word. Teach His promises. How we're to do this, we're to do it in love. We're to have on the whole armor of God, according to Ephesians 6. You put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil with compassion, with insistence, with persistence, dependence on the Holy Spirit and God to guide you. Make our daily walk one befitting of a Christian. Look at 1 Thessalonians, and we'll close with this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1. 
Now, last week I preached on the second coming of the Lord from chapter 4. Chapter 5 says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Now, the times and seasons are talking about when the Lord is coming. And clearly here, Paul says, Brethren, you have no need that I write and tell you about these things because we don't need to know. Only God the Father and God the Son. Now people say, well, only the Father knows. But I'm telling you, if the Father knows, the Son knows. But the day will come when the Father says, Son, go call my children home. But of the time and the season, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. When people start setting dates and start talking about, well, I know when the Lord's coming, or I'm going to predict somebody's going to come right in this area, that's dangerous. And he says, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Amen. You ever had a thief break in your home and steal? It's not a fun thing, is it? And, and you don't know when they're coming. If you'd known what they were going to do, you would have been ready. Now that's the same analogy of the coming of the Lord. You don't know. I don't know. Now we can feel the day approaching and we see the signs around us and we know surely it must be close. But he says, For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness. That means you're not unregenerate. That that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Now, does that mean we can't lay down and sleep at night? No, that's not what that means. But what it does mean is that when you lay down and sleep, you pray and you talk to the Lord. And, and if the Lord were to come, you have been praying and talking to Him, so you are expecting Him because you're looking for Him all the time. Just about every night I go to bed. I say, Lord, this may be the night. This may be the night when you return. So we are to be prepared. The Bible goes on and says, For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith, love for helmet, and the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now, I believe this is one of the verses that clearly delineate that before the wrath of God falls upon this world, He's going to take out His children. Before the flood fell upon Noah and his children who were saved, they were safely inside the ark. They weren't taken unprepared. They were ready. And so are God's children. And he says, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Make our daily walk one befitting of a Christian. 
We are to be sober, vigilant, honest, trustworthy, blameless, bearing in mind that Christians must be judged not for salvation, but for the way we have used the abilities and gifts that God has given us. Every professing Christian is leaving a mark on this life. Some are glorifying uh, the Lord, while others become occasions for the lost to mock God and His people. What kind of Christian living are we exemplifying? May the Lord help us. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Lord, for all your many promises. Be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.